Good morning. It's a wonderful day, and um, as you were told, I live in Scotland. In fact, I live very near Edinburgh. And I took the train down yesterday, um, and I stayed overnight in Brixton, and I walked up to your church this morning. And thank you very much again for the kind invitation. Now, I know Brixton relatively well because I used to travel from Highbury, where I lived, to where I worked in Redhill. So I used to pass through Brixton, but I'll mention that later on. But what I would like to start with today, I would like to start with my mother, because my mother came to this country in 1951. I stood on the docks in Jamaica and see her ship sailing away in 1951. And I did not see her again until 1955, when she worked from 1951 to 1951 to save my fare to bring me here. In fact, she left me with her sisters in Almond Town in Kingston. And her sisters, I can't even remember how many there were. The house was full of her sisters. And her sisters were strict disciplinarian. Children are supposed to be seen and not heard. You had to go to church three times every Sunday. That was compulsory. And if you didn't want to go to church for any reason, you had to take castor oil. <laughs> because you must be sick. <laughs> and therefore, I was brought up in church. That's the basis of my education in Jamaica. So when I arrived in 1955, on my own, I traveled from Jamaica. I was 14 years old. And I traveled and I arrived at Liverpool in 1951 on the Ascania. And my mom was meeting me in Paddington. So I arrived in Liverpool, I had no idea where Paddington was. So I asked, and I got a train, met my mother in 1955 in Paddington. I didn't recognize her. She came up and this woman grabbed me by the shoulder and said, come boy, I'm your mother. And of course, you don't question your mother. <laughs> so she took me home to where she lived, near Pentonville Prison in North London, in the one room in the attic. And she fed me, and we went to our beds on two single beds. And the morning, six o'clock, I just traveled 5,000 miles. The woman woke me up and gave me the great shock of my life. She said, boy, you're going to work. <laughs> now, I never heard about work in Jamaica for boys. So we got dressed, had some breakfast, and she took me to the door in North London, 1955, 4th of March. And there was a man at the door. And the man at the door asked my mother, is that your son? And she said, yes. And he asked her where she was going. And she said, he came yesterday from Jamaica and I'm taking him to work. And the man said, you can go to work, but he can't. He's not 15. I was 14 years and 11 months. The reason why I'm speaking to you today is that one month. Because I had to go to school. And the first school she took me to in North London they said I was educationally subnormal. I was ineducable. And therefore, I had to go to Shelburne Road Secondary Modern School. Shelburne Road Secondary Modern School was a secondary modern school at Nags Head in London. And the headmaster took me, and I was very good at cricket. <laughs> so I played cricket at my school, and I got picked to play for London. Within a month I was here, I was playing for London. 
and the local grammar school, Highbury, the headmaster rang my school and said he wanted me transferred <laughs> because he needed a cricketer. <laughs> so that's how I got into the grammar school in 1955 in London, 1955. And I will fast forward a bit because we don't have time. But I went to the grammar school. I left in 1958, got a job at London University as a technician in 1958. I had to walk through the Notting Hill Gate riots to get to work because the place, the, 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 the college was in Kensington. I left my first job and I got into Leicester University with the help of the professor. I got a degree in botany in 1964, came back to London, went to the labor exchange and they gave me two jobs. After asking me what I could do, I said I had a degree. The guy turned around to his mate and said, here you are, this guy's got a temperature. They gave me two jobs. One was to peel potatoes in a restaurant and the other one was in a betting shop. I took the job peeling potatoes at Beale's restaurant. And then I had two interviews, one with the second most powerful politician in Britain. And he told me to go home and grow bananas. I did point out to him it's difficult to grow bananas in Haringey. And I had a second interview in Edinburgh to do a PhD and the lady, the professor there took me and I did my PhD in two years. And I left Edinburgh and I got a job in Redhill at the research institute which the Brewers owned and I worked there from 68 until 77. And during that period, my research changed the whole of the thinking worldwide on cereals, on barley. So what children are learning about barley science and biochemistry is my work. And I use that scientific work to develop an industrial process called barley abrasion. So if you type in on your phone, barley abrasion, that's my development and that was done in Surrey. And within one year of the research, Bass Charrington's Allied Breweries, Watney Truman's were using that process to process their malt. So the process is called barley abrasion and that work was done in Surrey. I then went back to Edinburgh in 1977 to teach at the university. And I start teaching at the Harriet Watt University in 1977. In 1985, the Guinness Company contacted me and said, Professor, would we like you to go to Nigeria for us? The Guinness Company, who owns Diageo, was having trouble in Nigeria. They have four breweries there, and the government had banned the import of European grain into Nigeria. So Guinness said, could I go to Nigeria because of my expertise on cereals to see what I could do? And I went to Nigeria four times, and I advised the company they must use the local African grain to make their product because it is possible. And they did just that. And today, sorghum, the local African grain, is used all over Africa. All over Africa. It has transformed the lives of all the small farmers in Africa because the big company now buys sorghum, the local African grain. And when I was in India, I was there and they were discussing a group of people, what they should do with their product. And I advised them, and now that product is selling well in Britain, I'm told, and the product is called Cobra. <laughs> so it was a Jamaican from Almond Town that got Cobra into this country. 
However, just towards the 2017, that's the celebration of the abolition of the slave trade, 200 years, I started to do a lot of work on our history, the links between British history and the Caribbean. And you've got to know, you probably know, Britain had, at the end of slavery, 1833, before emancipation, Britain had 800,000 slaves in the Caribbean. 800,000. Jamaica had 300,000 slaves. 300,000. Jamaica was more important to Britain than America. So if you know of a Rodney Street in Britain, Rodney Street reflects the importance of Jamaica. Because Rodney was sent to Jamaica to defend it in 1782, while Britain was fighting for America. Britain defended Jamaica because they needed Jamaica. Jamaica was providing over 50% of the income from slavery. Jamaica was. And therefore, that island, I've checked the Jamaica telephone directory. There are more Campbells, Scottish Campbell name, in the Jamaica telephone directory than any Scottish city. So Jamaica has a very strong Scottish link. The Jamaica flag and the Scottish flag are the same design. It's just different colors. It was a Scotsman that designed the Jamaica flag. So again, that's a link between Scotland and Jamaica. So if you're a Jamaican, go to Scotland, it, you own it. <laughs> <laughs> However, what I would like to also point out is that, and the reference has been made to it, the contributions we've made. And what I would like to end with is that our history is critical because if we talk about Christianity first, when my mother came up to Edinburgh when I was receiving a Doctor of Science degree, she came up to Edinburgh and when she went back to Haringey, I took her back and she was talking to her neighbor and her neighbor says, Miss Ivy, what's your son doing in Scotland? And my mother said to Miss Pennycook next door, she said, well, I'm still at school. <laughs> and then Miss Pennycook says, well, what else is he doing? And my mother says, he's God's vehicle. <laughs> and therefore, whatever I've done, it's God's doing. It has nothing to do with me. And therefore, what I will do is to just end with a little story about our history. If you've heard of William Wilberforce, you can put your hand up. William Wilberforce, you've heard the name. But have you heard the name Henry Dundas? One, okay, two, three. Henry Dundas, he has a statue in Edinburgh, 150 feet tall, 150 feet in the middle of Edinburgh. What did he do? He stopped Wilberforce from abolishing the slave trade for 15 years. And I calculated it caused over 600,000 Africans to be transported into slavery because he said the slave trade should be gradually abolished. And that was accepted by Parliament. Our slavery is different. Our slavery was racial slavery. Our slavery was racial. It had to be abolished by Parliament. And therefore, Henry Dundas used that. And I said to Edinburgh Council, we must change his plaque to reflect what he did, delaying the abolition of the slave trade. It was not on his plaque. And Edinburgh Council deliberated. The family of Henry Dundas rejected it. They didn't want it. To cut a long story short, we have changed that plaque. Slavery is on Henry Dundas's plaque. And if you go to Edinburgh, that plaque reads, to begin with, Henry Dundas, the powerful politician. He controlled India. He controlled the Caribbean. He attacked Haiti. He lost 40,000 British troops destroying Haiti. That one man. 
He sent Earl Balcaras as governor to Jamaica, and Balcaras transported the Maroons to Nova Scotia. We've changed his plaque, and what I've said is now on his plaque after 200 years. <laughs> and I would like to end. You've noticed with Prince Charles saying, I'm fortunate to be one of the 10 people who had their portraits painted. And what I've said, is, it seems to be now reflected on Twitter, what I've said is that we are one humanity. No race is inferior to the other race. Race is a myth. We are one humanity. Nothing less. Thank you.